H is interestingly um, quite related to B biology. And then talk about um, what, what ants you might have in your apiary, how to identify them. And if you should decide to do something about your ants to try to prevent ants from getting into your hives or to use pesticides, um, what your options might be, what experience I've had over the years. And then hopefully there's room for like a discussion or question and answer at the end of that. So um, here we go. If I can, it's hard for me to see all of my slide because there's all this stuff from Zoom on it. But um, so this is just a little bit of biology, kind of phylogeny of, about ants and bees and wasps. So it's very interesting to me, at least, that um, ants and bees all both belong to this order called uh, um, a, a, a cellulite, a calulate. Uh, which is a subfamily in Hymenoptera, which is all are all the winged insects. There are about 150,000 species of winged insects. The aculeate um, order is a subfamily of stinging insects with wings. And so you might look at an ant and say, well, I don't see wings on this thing. But remember that the queens do develop wings and go on mating flights and then settle down somewhere. For me, it seems like they're always against a fence in my yard because that's where the wind carries them. They hit a fence and fall, and then they lose their wings after that, and they just live in their colony. Um, <clears throat> so all hymenoptera are hollow metabolic, meaning that they go through four stages of life, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. So ants do this. Of course, honeybees do this. Ants and bees build nests. They're central place foragers, meaning that they don't wander around and forage and then settle down there for the night. And then the next night wind up somewhere else. They have nests that are centrally located that they forage out of and they're social. So being a social insect means that you live in a large multi-generational colony. Um, the individuals in the colony are extremely, extremely, extremely specialized. So we've got nurse bees, we've got foragers, we've got drones, we've got a queen. Um, there may be just one or a few members of the colony that, that mate and produce offspring. So like, you know, having a queen and the workers of these colonies give up their own reproductive, um, functioning to serve that one queen or queens that, that carry out the reproductive duties for the, for the hive. And that benefits their reproductive fitness to give up their own reproductive functioning. Um, so all species of ants and about 10% of bees show this form of like being a social insect. A female queen ant, just like a female queen bee, bee um, can lay fertilized eggs or unfertilized eggs leading to like, you know, sterile male, males or, um, or females. Um, so getting right into the ants part. Um, these are the uh, sort of the main I identifying features of an ant. If you if you find one in your garden, in your garage or, or your garage, um, they have antenna, they have heads, they have a thorax, they have an abdomen, and you know most of us are getting older, and to really be able to identify these uh, anatomical features, you sort of almost need a, a dissecting microscope. Which, if you want, you can find them on Amazon for pretty cheap or eBay. I have one that I use for all sorts of things like taking splinters out looking at bees, looking at ants, you know, it's fun to have one at home. Um, and I, you know, when you, when you go through and identify, if you have an ant and you have a microscope, one of the key um, differentiators is this thing called a petiole. So some ants have one of these petioles and some ants have two petioles. And that pretty much gives you like a 50, 50 chance if you're in this column of four options of ants or this other column that has like another four options of ants here in Northern California. Um, these, these are some, some screen captures that I got from a site um, here in California, it's, it's here in California um, that sort of lay out some key distinguishing features of ants that we, that we have locally. Um, so Argentine ants are the most prevalent ant here 
in Northern California, but there are others that we that we have um, around. So there's this thing called a pavement ant, a southern fire ant, a pharaoh ant, an odorous house ant, and um, a, a tiny, tiny thing called a thief ant. And so, again, one of the major ways that you can classify these things, in addition to size and odor, if you if you crush them. And where they like to nest is this, is this thing called like a petiole, which is like a little spiky thing that happens to kind of pop out around their, their waist between their abdomen and thorax. Yeah. So in, in preparing for this talk, I, I did not come across an ant called a crazy ant, but I feel like I've read or heard something about it, right? Oh, really? And they run around crazy like? Oh, interesting, I don't know. Okay, so that's something to follow up on for sure, yeah. Um, no, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't see anything about a crazy ant. Is that like a, like a derogatory term for one of these other guys, you know, like a pharaoh ant or something? People call oh, it a crazy that's ant. That's actually a relative of mine is a crazy ant. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I have. I hadn't heard of a crazy ant. I hadn't come across it in the in this in the survey that I was doing for this thing. Um, but so, what you could do, Peter, is go to the UC University of California IPM website and try to identify this crazy ant using something like this. You need to have a microscope, or if you or if you want to capture one, I'll come by. And I'll bring it home and I can look at it under my microscope and try to figure out what this thing is. But um, this is a common sort of way that you would, as a biologist, go through physical characteristics and kind of go down certain pathways until you figure out like what you might have, right? So the first step would be like, okay, does it have one node or two nodes? And if it's got one node, you go on to um, step two. Step two says, is the thorax smooth and evenly rounded when viewed from the side, or is it uneven in shape when viewed from the side? And you kind of have to, you know, you're under a microscope, a dissecting scope at like maybe 10x power. You could, you could maybe do it with readers if you've got like some 2x readers. Turn the thing on its side. Is it round and smooth, or is it kind of, can you see that? Yeah, is it, is it rounded and smooth, or is it kind of bumpy? Well, if it's, if it's uneven in shape when viewed from the side, go to step four. Step four is the node, that petiole, is it kind of tucked up against uh, the abdomen or is it kind of freestanding on its own like a, like a spike? Um, and if, it's, if the node is erect and it's dull brown in color and it gives off, and if the ant gives off a musty odor when crushed, it's probably an Argentine ant. Uh, and on the, on the right hand of the slide is, things you would go through if you had an ant with two of those, those petioles around its waist, two nodes. And you go down and you look at like how many segments are on the antenna. Um, do they have eyes or not? And for the mouth parts, do they have this, um, what are they called? Just two small teeth or three small teeth. So good luck, you know, trying to identify that on an ant that you've found that's halfway smushed and you're trying to rotate it in your microscope. Uh, but you could you could probably spend a couple hours and in, in, eh, maybe fifteen minutes and and figure out what you have and so so you know looking looking at these these diagrams it's kind of hard for me to tell just by looking oh that's an Argentine ant that's a pavement ant that's a southern fire ant that's a carpenter ant and I think like this is clearly the easiest way for me to say oh yeah those are the ants that I have in my hive or or running up and down my hive stand or Having, having this long stream into my garage, going into like the boxes that I have that still have a little bit of honey on them. Um, these, are, these are Argentine ants. And for me, they look just super familiar. It's like what I see everywhere. Um, the interesting thing here I, I, I wanted to share was that the Latin name um, Linipithema humile means a cursed thing. So Linipithia, Linipithema means a cursed thing. And humility means like, you know, humility or being humble, right? And so it's low, lowly, small, or slight. So small accursed things. 
for what these guys are named, these Argentine ants. Um, so, you know, I, I had always wondered, right? So in the summer, it seemed like that's when my ant problem started, like in my, in my bee yard, just, which is on the side of my house. Um, all, all my bees, all my hives are up against the side of our house. And then we've got like maybe 10 feet and then a fence. And every time I would get down on my hands and knees to try to figure out where these darn ants are coming from, it's always like at the base of the fence. And I always thought like, ah, this just seems so random, right? Like why not just set up a shop, set up shop under my hive stands or under the plant where the sprinkler is kind of spraying water. Why are these guys always up against my fence? And so, and I hadn't realized this, right? That um, as colonies are established, they, they come from these queens that have mated and that have wings, right? So they fly around, they mate, and then the wind carries them somewhere. And in my case, they, would be you know hit up against a fence and then just fall to the ground and start making their colony there which i thought was super interesting um so so almost like a beehive you know with a swarm it, it's a little bit different in this case and in, in that not like half of the ants swarm off somewhere and make a new colony they're founded by these queens going off and you know founding these colonies and that's and that's what the, what that stage is called it's called the founding stage so after mating, the queen starts a new nest and raises her first, her first um, workers. There's a growth stage where they kind of build up the colony population. They start living in that stage and then they enter like a reproductive um, stage. And so, um, you know, the queen mates and then there are a couple of different options for how she establishes a colony or, or, or if she just joins another colony. Um, she can return to the original nest. And, and so in that case, there might be a couple of queen ants in this colony, like keeping this population alive, or she can form like a, like a secondary colony. In this, and in this diagram, it's, it's shown as, a, as described as a nest budding taking place. And that seems to be like what the case, how this happens in my backyard or my side yard. There's a colony here, there's a colony there, there's another one. They all seem to have the same, like, you know, and this is just anecdotal, right? Like, I don't know how many ants are coming out of these colonies. I haven't like dug the colony up, but it seems like the same number of ants are coming out of like three colonies at any time. And so. I think so, yeah. Could you repeat the questions that are asked on site? Yeah, I, I can, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, does the queen have one reproductive sort of flight? And then what happens after that, I guess? Yeah, so uh, it, it, this is my understanding is that she goes on a, like a reproductive flight, just like a, a, a queen bee. Um, she mates, she loses her wings, and then she can either join, go back to the original colony, and there can be like a multi-queen super ant colony, or she can land against the fence somewhere else and then find somewhere and start laying eggs there and make a budding like like bud off make a bud here they're calling it a nest bu nest budding process where she forms a new colony like that yeah there's another there's another th a third category called social parasitism where a new colony would be formed by parasitizing the nest of a different ant species but for me maybe it's, it, it's hard to understand how a mated queen would go suddenly parasitize a whole new colony, right? I mean, maybe she goes and kills the queen and she replaces her or something like that, I guess. Um, so just one more, a little bit more technical slide about this like ant um, colony life cycle. I, I like to start, so on this left-hand side of the screen in this panel here, I, I just like to start with queen it's easy for me to see the flow, right? Like, so, so she can either produce haploid eggs, so eggs that are not fertilized, which result in the production of male larvae, or fertilized eggs, which um, can be, in this case, worker larvae or gyne larvae, which are sexual larvae, based on the exposure to different um, 
factor. So here they're calling it factor A and factor B. Um, and then these, these, these ants mate in this reproductive phase and then um, form a new, can form a new queen that way. Um, on the right side of the right side of the slide is um, sort of a, a graph showing time on the x-axis in years and on the y-axis biomass. So how much ant material lives in one of these colonies? It, you could you could think of it as like the number of ants, right? And so at time zero, when a when a colony is just being produced, it's 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 labeled as belonging to this found. Uh, this founding stage where the population is increasing. Um, this is the ergonomic stage. And then once the colony reaches some certain number, you know, maybe it's, maybe this is dependent on the population. Maybe it's dependent on time of the year, maybe a combination of these things, food resources. Um, it goes into this, this reproductive stage, right? Where it's almost like a like how a bee colony emit, emits a swarm, right? Makes a new queen, emits a swarm, and at that time, like the bio, the relative biomass decreases in the original colony. A new colony forms, and this sort of cycle continues over the years until the queen and the colony die off. <clears throat> so, this is a on the left. On the left is a is a diagram that I found from another UC website um, showing the life cycle of an Argentine ant colony in, in a coastal California vineyard. So probably, you know, super close to us. And it, it, it's, not, it's not showing like the, 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 the biomass or the population of the colony per se, but instead the relative um, populations of males, reproductive pupa, reproductive larvae, adult workers, worker pupae, and worker larva, okay? So, so if you look at January and February, which is where we are now, it's all adult workers and a queen. Um, but as we move into March, April, May, June, like spring and summer months, the number of pupa in the colony, like dramatically, the proportion of the total population dramatically increase. So this is this is entering that ergonomic ergonomic phase of the colony's life cycle, with where the colony is really building up, just just like our ant, our just like our bees, right? There's more larvae, um, and they're really like just they're booming. Um, there's more food resources available to them, especially if they're in your apiary, as bees are bringing in nectar and, and honey or pollen. Yeah, Peter. Yeah. So the question was, did they say where this data was collected? Um, so it, it says here that the nest, the nest collection site was in San Luis Obispo County. So a little bit south of here, maybe it's a little bit warmer and they can, they don't have that seasonal diapause or resting of, of the queen. Maybe the queen is more active then. And so there's more um, or less here versus there. Um, and so we've all, we've all, <laughs> You know, if you're working in your yard landscaping, or you're just curious, and you start lifting over, lifting up rocks, or you see ants coming, you know, out of the picture on the right is showing like what one of these colonies looks like, and it's it's not really as organized as I thought it would be. I mean, maybe this picture is kind of a mess. Maybe they've just turned the soil over, and everything's just a big jumble. But you know, I kind of thought it'd be more structural. Um, here, it just looks like a mess of larvae and some ants crawling over them, right? But I guess you could do your own experiment in your in your yard. Um, so it makes it makes sense that in April, May, June, July, through September, just like with bees, um, the nutritional needs of the colony are going to change. Um, you know, you might you might go outside and look at your hives and see the foragers bringing in big pollen baskets full of pollen or no pollen coming in and, and the forger just look big and round like big big 747s just kind of lumbering in like carrying all this nectar into your hive and that's the same with these guys so um 
in an ant colony, carbohydrates are, are eaten by the workers. So for our, for our bees, those are, that's, that's honey. And then proteins are consumed by the growing larva. And so for us, that's like bee bread, right? From, that's per fermented pollen. And just like in a, in a bee colony, the foragers are the ones that are going out and collecting the stuff and bringing it in. And the harvesting strategy of the foragers is very much dependent on the relative um, proportions of the population of larva and, and mature workers, right? And so I, I thought this, this, um, this figure from a scientific paper on the right hand of the slide was, was very interesting. And so um, this is an experiment where they took, I don't know, 50 colonies of, of Argentine ants and gave them a choice of a protein food source or a, carbo or a carbohydrate food source. And for each of the food sources changed the concentration of them. So one of them was like, for example, like a really, um, like a very um, mild sugar solution, like a, maybe a 5% sucrose solution in water. Their other choice was, well, here it is, 100 grams of sugar per liter, 200 grams of sugar per liter, or 300 grams of sugar per liter. And if you, if you look at the lines in these plots, there's, there's like, for example, in, this, in panel B here, there's this line here showing um, circles, Circles are depicting colonies that don't have larva. So like maybe what we would see outside now, like in our yards or, and colonies shown here on this, on this line that have, um, are depicted by X's. So these are colonies with larva. And so they let these ants go out and choose what food source they want. Do they want the proteins? Do they want the carbohydrates? Um, and, and they also measured how much they're bringing, like how much they're bringing back into the into the hive or into the colony. And so the, the, the take home here is that colonies with larva make sense that they need more protein. So that's what they went out and foraged, more protein than colonies that didn't have larva. And so that's, that's why the, the, the line with the, with the circles, the without larva is biased towards the carbohydrate side. And the line, the lower line with, with all the X's on it, that's the hive with larva is more biased towards uh, protein. And the other interesting thing is that if you, if you look at how much food material is being brought in, the colonies with larva are bringing in more material than colonies without larva. So unlike bees or dogs, you know, they're, maybe they're kind of more like cats. Like our cat will just kind of graze around and eat when he needs to eat. Whereas dogs, if you cut a, cut a hole in the dog food bag and leave it on your floor, he's going to wolf the whole thing down, right? Just like our bees, they're bringing it as much as they, as they possibly can and storing it or, you know, sort of consuming it. But these ants regulate like how much they bring in based on like what's happening in the, in the, in the colony, which is interesting. And I'm, I'm showing you this slide because this matters later if you decide to treat your bee yard for ants when you're selecting your pesticide, okay? So I've heard people say, this is, and this was me up until I started looking at this stuff, eh, what does it matter if there's some ants in my beehive, right? Not a big deal, who cares, right? Yeah, they're stealing some honey. Yeah, they're angering the bees a little bit, but eh, who cares, right? Until you've got, a hive box that's full of ants that has no bees in it. And so I always wonder, like, are the ants coming in and taking advantage of a weak colony by, and, and taking the honey, maybe taking some protein out, angering the bees, upsetting the bees, and that's kind of helping to um, weaken the colony? Or are the ants just responding to a weak colony that's gonna die anyway in collecting food resources as the, as the colony is crashing. And so I never really knew what the answer was to that. I always kind of just let the bees, I mean, let the ants do their thing in the bee yard. Cause really, what am I gonna do if I've got 11 hives? Like 
spend all the time battling ants out there, which seemed like totally fruitless. Um, and so I, I'm guessing that that's probably you all's perspective is, yeah, there's some ants, but what am I really going to do about it, right? Well, so, and I, I, like, as I was preparing this thing, I wanted to know, like, are, are these, are ants a problem? Like, should I, should I care about ants being in my, in my hives? And I, I came across a really interesting part of the scientific literature that says, yeah, in addition to, in addition to stressing out my bees and robbing my hives, they do carry viruses into the hive. And so um, the panel A is just, you know, some weird representative picture of ants bothering bees. B is, you know, ants like just getting in and consuming, collecting honey and, and you know, larval material and, and, and that kind of thing. C is they're kind of climbing over an emerging adult bee. Um, <clears throat> but this paper that, I'm, that I cite at the bottom here also found that ants, including Argentine ants, are carrying in deformed wing virus, cashmere beer virus, bee virus, and another one that I hadn't heard of called moku virus into the hives. So I said, oh, gee, this is super interesting, right? Like, let me go into this black hole of ants carrying viruses into beehives and found two more papers that, yeah, confirm that disease transmission is likely through visitation of multiple hives by ants. So if you've got one hive that's full of deformed wing virus or Israeli you know, paralytic virus and ants are going into there and they go back to their nest and the foragers are looking around and they enter another hive. Well, guess what? They're carrying those viruses from hive to hive. And um, this screenshot that I have on the right side is from a, from a journal called Scientific Reports, very highly reputable. This isn't like American Bee Journal where you can write whatever you want and they'll publish it. Um, this study found that <clears throat> they detected at least one virus in 89% of the ant samples collected from an apiary site, 87%, I'm sorry, 89%, but only in 15% of the ants collected at a non-apiary site. So bees in an apiary, I'm sorry, ants in an apiary have more virus on board than ants just sort of out in you know, an empty field, for example. <clears throat> And then so this paper on the on the right hand side of the thing confirmed that yeah that these guys these ants are con, um, carrying deformed wing virus and that they do exchange path pathogens within the local um, bee community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, so, so the, in case you guys online didn't hear that gentleman um, said that, yeah, there's probably not other bee colonies within 100, 100 yards of, of his hive. And so what does this mean? And I think, I think it means that if, if you've got a hive that's got some virus in it, that virus is possibly getting passed around, not only by mites, you know, in your bee yard, or um, as I think Ed or um, Art mentioned on the call, like as we were all streaming in, yeah, these guys, mites hitchhike on bees and can be passed from bee to bee at, at flowers or foraging sites. But now, you know, maybe it's possible that bees are also transmitting viruses from your one hive to another hive to another hive in your bee yard. Um, so it's hard to know, and there may not be a scientific literature that allows us to have insight into like to what degree these ants are actually transmitting viruses and causing your hives to become sick i don't know but it's it's certainly um like a non-zero um probability that they're transmitting viruses around That's a really interesting question. So the question was, do ants like our bees store carbohydrate or, or protein in their hives and, or their colonies? And I don't, I don't know the answer to that. In the couple of times that I've taken a shovel and just 
tried to dig up an ant colony to see what it looks like in there. I mean, you don't see like a bunch of anything other than larva and mad ants, but who's to say that they, I don't know that they don't, but it's interesting in that, in that previous slide that I showed you about the choice preference, right? Do they go for proteins or they go for carbohydrates? In colonies that had larva, they br did bring in more food than colonies without larva. So maybe they're, for, they're just increase their forage because they can't store. There's no storage space down in the dirt. I don't know. Right. I don't know. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah, that's right. So, so um, he, he reminded us that certain ants cultivate species of fungus inside their colonies that may provide them with some source of food. And, and I think also ants, some ants have relationships with aphids, right? Like, don't they? Right, that honeydew, right? And so I don't know if this happens down in the ant colony or in a log or Peter's, Peter knows. Okay, it's, it's on the leaves of my plum trees, yeah. This is why the county is running around like putting these things up in my plum trees, I guess, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I've got aphids all over my, um, oh yeah, all kinds of stuff in my garden. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So I, I don't know, do, do ants enslave aphids in some way and bring them down as a food source and feed them what they need and the, ants, the aphids give them back? So it's some sort of like, there's a relationship, a symbiotic relationship between the- The, yeah. ants, the ants will protect the aphids from other predators and then they harvest the honeydew and take that back to their colony. Yeah, and are, have you ever seen honey, honeydew honey? Yes. Oh, yeah, honeydew I, honey? No. No? I think that may be from honeydew melons. No. No? You think it is from honeydew <laughs> from aphids? Know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That'd, be, that'd take a hell of a lot of aphids to make honey. Maybe it would, yeah. But it is called honeydew from the aphids. And one of the ways that you can tell that you've got a problem is you look like a black soot on your leaves. I grew up on a citrus farm. Mm -hmm. And um, that was how we could tell that we had um, aphid problems was that it would make kind of a black sooty mm -hmm. um, um, coating. And then you would look and sure enough, there would be ants crawling up the, the, um, the trunk and uh, ants would keep away other predators uh, that mm -hmm. would normally uh, eat the aphids. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, so. You know, these are these are the hypothetical or theoretical concerns. Maybe you want to do nothing about ants. Maybe you care about ants a little bit. Maybe you want to go crazy and try to eliminate every single ant within 100 yards of your bees. I don't know. It's up to you to decide. Um, yeah. Are there any ants that eat mites? I don't know. That would be a, a great ant to have around. <laughs> We can breed them. Oh, interesting. Peter said that if, if you've got a colony full of ants and you pull out the inspection tray, you'll, you'll see ants carrying away the carrying away mites. Uh-huh. They'll carry away anything that's edible. Yeah, right. So, um, you know, if, if you decide to do something about your ants, there are, there are a couple of different approaches, right? This, on this slide, I'm, I'm showing three um, examples of like physical barriers or, or deterrents. A lot of people over the years, including, including me, have tried these kind of hive stands with little moats or little, um, you know, little, little, I don't know what you want to call them, like little receptacles that you might pour olive oil or motor oil or some kind of grease inside these things that the ants can't crawl over to get up your hive stand legs. These ones look really fancy. Um, 
I, you know, I, I put my legs in like flower pots one year and filled those things with like yucky old kitchen grease. Um, it works great. Um, if you've got a bee yard of 20 to 40 hives, I don't, I don't think you're probably doing this. Like if you're a commercial person, they probably need a lot of, of care and upkeep to make sure that you don't have debris in your little pools of oil that the ants can just kind of wor you know, work, over, work over to get up into the hives. There's always gonna be spillage you know, as you're trying to pour oil into these things every week or month or whatever. I, I spent like a couple of years messing with this tangle foot, which you can buy at like orchard supply hardware. It's a super, super, super sticky, like caramel like material that you apply around the legs of your hive stand. It's it's so gross and it's so sticky. You get it all over your hands. I like how in the advertisement this this lady just is like, you know, just applying it and it's nice and clean. But literally, like within a week, it it turns into this this kind of sub picture that I have here. It turns gross, it kind of melts. There's all kinds of dead bees in it. Your gardener comes by with a leaf blower and it, you know, all the leaves and, sh and stuff get caught up in this, in this tangle foot. And then you've got to either scrape it off or just apply it, just slav slather on a new layer on top of that. You know, so it becomes this nasty, nasty mess. And the, and the ants, it, it only takes like a week or two for the ants to figure out how to get over this, the dead bees and like the leaves and twigs that are, have blown into this stuff from the wind or your gardener. Yeah, Peter. Oh, really? Oh my gosh. Peter said that his bees, have, they harvest tanglefoot. That's why you're, you think it's propolis holding your thing together. It's not, it's tangle, it's dried tanglefoot. So this stuff, yeah, it's, it's just, it's gross and they figure out a way, right? Where there's a will, there's a way. Um, people online have, have talked about using botanicals like cinnamon because apparently ants, they supposedly don't like the smell. Cinnamon's super cheap. Um, when it doesn't work, you're ready for like Thanksgiving and cookie making season if you've got like a giant one pound container of cinnamon. And I couldn't find any scientific literature that said, yes, yeah, cinnamon works. But some, you know, somehow it's, this idea is propagated on the internet and people say, oh yeah, you know, you should try it, but it didn't work for me. Um, you probably need massive amounts of this stuff, right? Like just covering the ground around your hives. Oh, that's coming up. I have many slides on boric acid. Yeah. So, so those are all like physical deterrents, right? This slide gets into, if you decide you want to try to kill ants, this is, you know, here are a couple options for you. And I've, I've tried every single one of these over the years. Um, I, I like to be in the garage. I like building little things. I'm cheap. Um, and so you can go on um, the Napa County website and download a PDF that has a plan for these cool, like do it yourself bait stations where you take like a, a one liter Gatorade container, um, mix up your boric acid solution in sucrose, like in sugar water, pour that stuff in there, make these cool little bait containers that you leave around by your hives. And what's supposed to happen is the ants will find their way into these things through little holes, be exposed to boric acid and either be killed like right then and there, or they'll bring home this sugar solution containing boric acid to your colony and wipe out the colony. So it's cheap to make these things. It's kind of fun. Or for some of you, it's, this is not fun at all to be in the garage making these things. Um, for me, like, they would get knocked over by the gardener, by the wind, like animals in my yard. I'll talk about boric acid, but if you're not within 0.05% of the correct concentration with your boric acid solution, it's either going to kill everything like there or not be, um, it'll be unpalatable to the ants, or maybe you'll be successful in their care. They'll, they'll take it back to the colony and wipe out the colony. Okay, so, and remember that at different times of the year, ants are interested in protein versus carbohydrates. So if you're providing them with a boric acid sucrose solution, they might only be interested in it half the year and it's not gonna be effective, okay? The, the middle part here is, is, is diatomaceous earth. 
So these are little critters, like microscopic organisms that have this um, silicon dioxide skeleton inside that I feel like when I was a kid, we used to throw this stuff in the pool for some reason. But you can see the picture here. It's just these little like scrapey, sharp edged, single celled organisms that apparently if you scatter this stuff around your hives and the ants crawl across it, it'll scrape holes in their exoskeletons. Um, so Di diatomaceous earth comes from diatoms, which are single cell, um, I think maybe algae, and it is silicon dioxide. And um, it is cheap. It also will kill hive beetles when they try to pupate in the ground around your hives. Mm. So it's, and the reason you used to throw it in your pool was that it would get trapped on the filter element and act as a, a trap for bacteria and algae. I guess that makes sense. Yeah, all the algae in your pool would be, be kind of washed over this stuff and just get sliced to ribbons, yeah. Well, it sticks to, it sticks to the diatomaceous earth and then you back flush your filter. Okay, yeah. It's in, and somebody in the room is telling us that it's used as, as a filtration agent in the wine industry as well. That's, mm -hmm. that's interesting. I have one recommendation. Uh, everybody puts the straps around the hives, but it's not right because you attract ants to your hives. You have to put traps far away from hives. Otherwise, you know, like, it's kind of like you invite them into the table mm -hmm. and they most attract to the honey if you drop off or mm -hmm. to the sugar syrup if you put it on the floor. So it's um, most of the time I've been in so many apiaries, people, you know, ask me to come and help and they put these traps right under the hive and it's like tons of ants around and it does not help so um if you want to kill them better to put it a little bit further like 10 8 10 foot far away yeah. same yeah, thing with it. yellow jacket traps don't put the yellow jacket traps around your hives put them around the edge of the yard yeah. Yeah, that's a really good. Yeah, that's a really good observation and suggestion. I think. Um, so that's that's diatomaceous earth. It's cheap. You know, there are, there are application questions, right? How much? Where do you put it? Do you dump a whole bag out at the base of your hives? And remember, it's only going to kill a small portion of ants that actually walk across it. Um, so your third option is is to just go full on out and and buy. I, commercial baits and intoxicants, right? So these are over-the-counter gels, bait stations, granules, this kind of thing. Um, I found that they do work. It can be confusing though. There are a lot of options, especially if you go to a, like a site like doyourownpestcontrol.com. They can be expensive. And in some states, you, you need a license to, to purchase these things. That's, that said, you can always find these things on eBay you know, people don't care about checking your license on eBay. And so I've heard. So, so some considerations around, around baits and, to and toxicants, if you're going to go this route. So, um, you know, all these baits need to have something that's going to attract the ant or whatever a cockroach fly to, to the toxicant. And remember, this could be carbohydrates, it could be proteins, it could be oils could be anything right and and these baits are construct or you know prepared in such a way that they're going to be interesting to cockroaches and ants or ants and mice or mice and rats or whatever so you kind of have to be you know selective about like what you buy and um you know you you need to think also about like do you want to kill only the foragers so this is, is this a really effective toxicant at a really high concentration that will kill anybody that comes in there? 
or do you want it to be a low concentration so that doesn't kill the foragers and they can load up on it and bring it back to the hive and share with everybody or the colony and share it with everybody in the colony and wipe out the colony that way. It takes a little bit longer for that to happen, but that's truly the best strategy, right? So I spent, you know, one summer, I collected all these yogurt containers and I drilled holes in the bottom of them and I added a bunch of like 20% sugar syrup solution. And I just sprinkled on a bunch of boric acid or borax into each one of these things. And I came back a couple of days later and I was like, oh my gosh, it worked, right? There's thousands of little dead ants in these things, but it never ended. I was like, oh, I got, the, I got them. I got them. They're, they're dead, but it never ended. It just went on and on and on for weeks like this. And I failed to think, think about that. Like, these are the foragers that I'm killing. Nobody's making it anywhere out of my little, you know, trap back to the, back to the colony. And then the, the, the queen ant was laying, you know, hundreds of new eggs every day, just providing me with more foragers to kill. And I wasn't really meeting my objective or my goal. So if you decide to buy like a commercial product, you know, there are tons of options um, that, that you can, that you can choose from. I'm not even going to try to pronounce these different compounds. I know not, I really know nothing about any of them. I didn't go like that deep down the, the rabbit hole. But I did want to talk about um, like borate bat based products, right? So this is your boric acid and your borax. Um, but some of these some of these bait products contain um, they do contain pesticides that will kill your bees if your bees wind up somehow getting into the bait stations, which is probably unlikely. But you never know, right? Like maybe one of these things gets knocked over, the gardener kicks it over, a raccoon or something. And then the winds pick up and it's this dust flying around your kind of enclosed bee yard space. You know, that, that could, I guess, theoretically happen. But um, I, I, again, I, I spent a whole summer messing around with boric acid and borax. And it sounds like people here have all, in the room have probably had some experience messing with boric acid or borax. The trouble with borax, there are three issues, right? So. Concent the concentration of boric acid or borax in your sugar, sugar syrup solution has to be exactly right, like exactly right. 0.5% to 4% is your kind of working range. And even in that range, um, the difference between 0.5 and 1 and 2% means killing every single forager that comes in there versus um, having the foragers load up on this stuff and bring it back to the colony. Okay, so, so borax, um, borax is something that's mined from the ground or collect, collected from evaporated deposits. It's sold as uh, laundry powder. So there's something called like 10, like, you know, 10 mule or mule train borax. 20, 20 mule train. 20 mule train that you just dump into your laundry, right? Or, it, it, you know, it's found in toothpaste, it's found in cosmetics. It can kill things, um, but it's you'd have to have you you'd have to eat a lot of it to, to have it have some effect on you. Borax can be processed into a purified chemical called boric acid, which is sold as a pesticide. The acute LD50, so that's the dose that would kill 50% of something that was exposed to it. So if you've got fifth, if you've got hundred mice. How, what's the concentration of boric acid needed to kill 50% of those mice or rats? Um, for rats, if you feed it to them orally, the LD50 is um, 2,600 milligrams per kilogram. Okay, so I weigh 72 kilograms. If, you, if I do the math, that means I have to eat a half a pound of uh, boric acid to kill me. That's probably like a a couple cereal bowls full of this stuff. <laughs> so, boric acid for breakfast. My wife will never, she'll never get me with boric acid. I'll notice. <laughs> uh, but it works by altering insect metabolism. Okay. Um, if you if you buy these prepackaged bait stations, they usually contain about five percent borax, and that's that at that concentration, you're just going to kill foragers. Maybe that's by design so they can continue to sell you more bait traps because the ants, they never go away. Yeah?
I think they need to ingest it to kill. Diatomaceous earth kills by contact. I've had very good luck with Toro, T-O-R-O, -O, green bait stations that go on to a green base and the base has too small a slit for the bees to come in, but it's big enough for the ants to come in. And it's boric acid, so it's not a petrochemical. Um, you know, uh, it's because they are very low to the ground. I don't have any trouble with squirrels or anything knocking them over. And um, that's uh, the ones in the clear plastic are a nightmare. They get, they mm -hmm. get, they're a mess. Yeah. But the yeah. green ones that look like a hockey puck, I've had very good luck with. Yeah. So, you know, again, it depends on the concentration of this, of boric acid or boron or, or uh, borax in, in the bait, right? So a point, 0 0.5 to 1% solution won't kill these guys on contact. They'll be able to consume it and bring it back to the colony. Um, so, yep. like I said, I spent a summer messing with this stuff and I was always so psyched because, oh my gosh, look how many ants that I killed. In other, in other concentrations that I tried, maybe it was 1%. I was like, man, nothing's happened in these things. I don't see any dead ants. These must not be working, right? So um, the relationship between the LT50, um, the, you know, the, the, so this is sort of the kill threshold is a log linear relationship. So this relationship is very, very critical. Um, and if you look online at these recipes, you know, I, and this is where I obtain my recipes, just random websites. They can be confusing to prepare. You know, then one of them might say to make one liter of this stuff. Well, you don't, you don't want a liter. You want, you know, maybe a, a cup full. So you're trying to convert from liter to cup. How much sugar is that? How much borax is that? Well, I don't have borax. So how much boric acid, um, there's solubility issues. If you got too much sugar in your solution, if it's super, super syrupy, guess what? The borax isn't going to dissolve in that. Um, and it's messy. It's sticky. You're in your garage. You're kind of thinking like, okay, I'm using an old spoon to stir this stuff up that I don't want to go back into the kitchen. So you're throwing away spoons and you're going to knock one of these things over. It's just, it's just a big mess. And so the, 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 the two things that we're almost out of time, the last two things, the, the, the tables on the bottom of this um, slide are showing, this is from a paper that was published looking at concentrations of boric acid or borax in a sugar solution, looking at the LT50. This is the lethal time in days. So how long, how many days does it take to kill an ant colony? And again, you kind of want more days. If, if you've got you know, the difference between a 0.5% concentration and a 1% concentration is twice as many days. So good luck being in your garage trying to figure out like cups to liters to milliliters to how much borax do I need to stir in this, in this sugar solution. It's, for me, it was impossible. And it turns out also that if you have a greater than 2% concentration of boric acid in a sugar solution, the ants don't even want to touch it. So there's this palatability and, and, and repellency issue. They can taste it above, or they can detect it above like 2% concentration. So I gave up with boric acid. I called up these guys that do my own pest control. And I said, look, I'm a beekeeper in Northern California. I've had some success with boric acid. I'm tired of it. Like, what do I buy? Just tell me what to buy. And so the guy recommended this one, two punch. Okay. Um, on the right are these Bayer Max Force like protein crystals or protein nuggets. There's a little bit of fat. There's some carb complex carbohydrate in there. Um, and on the right is this stuff called Opti OptiGuard, which is just kind of a sugary gel bait that you can squirt out of a syringe and it, it doesn't dry up. It stays kind of like a jello for a couple of days or a week. Um, I had all these ants in my hives. I put down like a, some of you guys know that I collect old like political signs after the elections. I use these as like sliders into my hive to look at might drop and stuff like this, right? So I have one of these things turned over and I put some of the granules and I put a big gob of um, this gel. I'm like, oh, this is gonna be awesome. Like, let's see what happens, right? 
And it was fascinating because all the ants went to the gel at that time of the year. I forget when it was, but it looked exactly like this picture. Like ants were like crawling over themselves to get to this gel. And I'm like, oh, this is amazing. This is awesome, right? And they weren't super interested in the granules, but within a, just a couple of days, no more ants. Like it just wiped them out. So for me, um, my plan or my strategy is I wait till I see a lot of ants. I throw some of these granules down. I squirt some of the stuff on like a piece of aluminum foil or on a rock. And like, that's it. It works so good. <laughs> they didn't. Yeah, they didn't like this sheriff versus that sheriff, right? They're, they're giving me their vote. <laughs> So um, and I also use this. It's really amazing. It's mm -hmm. you're right. It's two, three days, four days, and they continue coming until they clean it up. But after I don't have them a year already. Yeah, this stuff isn't cheap, right? So 30 bucks for a couple of these OptiGuard syringes and like 17 bucks for this Max Force bait. But do the math. Okay, that's 50 bucks. How much is a, is a hive full of bees or a nuke? You know, a lot more than that. So that's what I wanted to um, share with you. I'm happy to share the slides or, you know, whatever. Take questions or if you guys have things to say. Yeah, yeah. Take a picture. Get me out of the way. Yeah. Yes. So this thing is a neonicotinoid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 that's right, neonicotinoid, uh, this is a neonicotinoid, this thiamethoxam. Neonicotinoids are known to kill bees. I haven't seen bees um, down visiting this opti, opti gel stuff, OptiGuard, but that's not to say that you're, you know, now you're introducing neonics to your bee yard, so maybe that's a concern for you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a concern for sure. Yeah. Mm. I, yeah, I don't either. Yeah, I don't know if these, if this 0.01% of this thiamethoxam is something to worry about at all with my bees. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Where we've seen the most problem with neonicotinoids is that when they're sprayed on plants and they are a systemic poison, so it continues to um, give the bees the neonicotinoids in the pollen and in the nectar. This looks like a relatively uh, stable uh, application that the bees are not going to be eating continuously and taking back to their nest. But I'm not, I'm not a etymologist and I'm not a toxicologist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it seems like after a day or two, it's gone. Like they've collected it all and brought it back to their ant nest. So they, they remove it for you, you know? Yeah, same with the granules. Mm -hmm. If you can set up the bait station in such a way that bees cannot enter, but ants can, then you can definitely limit the exposure right. of bees to the toxin. Yeah, yeah. I'm... We might we we don't we don't we don't know how how stable it is like underground and how long it what its half life is and all that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That it could be, a, or it could be that they they literally consume all of it and metabolize it into, you know inert metabolites. 
to eat ants? I don't know. I thought you were going to ask, do, do we have to worry about chickens eating this, uh, this, these protein pellets? Or, you know, getting in, getting, picking, trying to pick at the ants, right? They're hitting this bait. I don't know. Brian. Sir. There's a old uh, method for um, uh, hive beetles where you put a, a fatty substance with poison in it in a CD disc holder and you cut a little crevice, you cut channels out on all four sides of the device and they can get in, but the bees can't. Ants can get in, but the bees mm -hmm. can't. High beetles can get in, but the bees can't. So you could probably uh, uh, use that method as well instead of just on a piece of paper. Yeah, yeah. It's probably not smart of me to just put it on a piece of foil and leave it out, right? Um, maybe foil, next yeah. this season I put it, I drew little holes in yogurt containers and leave it in there or something. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, did you have something? Do ants control termites? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe you want your ants then. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, there you go, yeah. Right, 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 right. That's an interesting idea, yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't know, I don't think so. So, so the the propose the idea was to take some double sided tape, wrap the double sided tape around your leg of your hive stand, and coat that double sided tape in diatomaceous earth. So it won't be sticky because it'll be already the stickiness will be covered in DE. So no ants, no bees are going to get stuck to it. But ants that run across it could be shredded up. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so rain, rain or sprinklers may be a hazard. Yeah. That's a good question, right? So what do bees in the wild do with ants? Um, yeah, although I have a I have a squirrel box in my yard that I let swarms move into that's probably 15 feet off the ground. And there's definitely a a train of ants going up to that squirrel box. So, you know, I, I don't know. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, is, is Syngenta known to be part of the neonic problem? in the world. I think, I think isn't Bayer? Bayer produces neonicotinoids as well. So are we supporting, yeah, is it like buying nicotine patches from Philip Morris? I don't know. That's something for you to consider, I guess, as a consumer. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Flea and tick treatments are neonics. I don't know what time we're supposed to end, but eight. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to keep people. Yeah. So when I was messing with the tangle foot, I would coat the, I would take a, like a plastic flower pot, cut a square in the bottom of it, slide it up the leg, coat with tangle foot, and then slide that thing down over it so that it would, you know, kind of keep some of the debris and bees from getting on it. But bees would always wind up like climbing up the legs and getting in the tangle foot still. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Okay. So- so Levi's saying axle, axle grease covered with like a, huh? okay, right. An upside down ant mode with, with, with axle grease on like the roof of this thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is our, you want high temperature axle grease. It's usually red. It won't melt in the summer and it will remain sticky for six to eight months. Okay. Okay. Oh, awesome. Okay, so lasts longer than a year. Get the red high temp stuff. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. I think we had a nice discussion. Hopefully this is a value to you in some way. Thanks. Thank you.